Peters again in Jesus' name. In this lesson, I want to try to clarify to the best of my ability, 1 John 1, 8 and 9. The biggest excuse that the collective consciousness of professing Christianity, inside and outside the systems, have out there today. The 1 John 1, 8 passage that, if I say I have no sin, there's no truth in me, is one of the biggest excuses we constantly keep hearing. I want to try to clarify that today in light of what it says in 1 John 1, 8 and 9. It says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And let's include in verse 10. And if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now they use this as their excuse to live a lifestyle of sin confess. Always meaning the worst possible sins. See, I've got to, I've got to believe that. You know, some people criticize me for making that assumption, but that's what I'm confronted with all the time. So I have to, if they don't clarify that we're talking about slip-ups and missteps here, then I have to assume that they mean the worst possible sins, that they can step out into darkness and back into the light and pick up where they left off. And I've heard people say that on their blogs. You need to pick up where you left off. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches about a Christian falling into sin, if indeed they're a Christian, and they sin willfully against their knowledge of the truth. It's a serious matter of a second repentance and restoring that such a person. But no one deals with that because they think 1 John 1, 9 has them covered. So I have to think that they're thinking some kind of magic cover. They think Jesus paid it all. They think uh, it's past, present, and future. And it's just a matter of uh, uh, technicality to confess all the time. Kind of like the Catholics going to confession. But what does it really mean? Could it possibly mean that we can walk around as Christians and constantly admit that we have sin dwelling in us, bringing about the actual commission of sins? I'm talking about sins unto death, like fornications or drunkenness or uncleanness and lust and all the rest of it, and sin and thought, word, and deed daily. And then we merely then keep on confessing these things via 1 John 1, 9. I read the whole passage. And we'll be cleansed of those sins, even while we're in the act of committing them. Because we're going to commit them again anyway. That's why I say it that way. Could the apostle have actually meant this when he, had, when he teaches in 1 John 3, verses uh, 8 and 9? He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil is sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose some man was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's the purpose of the cross, to destroy the works of the devil, not take your place so that you don't have to do what he commanded you to do. Whoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Now the word committeth and doeth, or doth, in the King James Version is translated practice all the time in the new versions. And I pointed this out in other videos before, but we'll do this again. The word in this Greek, the Greek word in this is paeo. And that means to produce or bear or perform or bring forth or keep or work. It's never translated practice, not even in Strom's. You could look it up on the blue letter, and, that, and that's a mainstream uh, prof, uh, system site. But they show the, the meaning, and it's never translated practice, like all the modern versions do. In other words, John is saying in this chapter that if you're truly born of God, you're not producing the fruit of sin in your life. And if you do produce, commit a bad tree producing bad fruit, this is it's used in the same context, the word paeo, then you're not of God but of the devil. Therefore, walking around, confessing that you have sin dwelling in you all day is not what 1 John 1, 8 is talking about. It could not possibly be. See, Jesus said to the religious, religious leaders in John 8, when they were claiming to be sons of Abraham, like you claim to be under grace, is saying, you know, we've never been admonished to anyone. He says, whoever committed sin is a slave to sin. Same word. He uses the word paeo. Who committeth sin. Whoever's producing the fruit of sin in their life. Thought, word, and deed, a daily, or whatever you want to call it, mistakes or mess-ups, is a servant of sin. He's a slave of sin. 
This is the reason John used the same word, because he was following his master's footsteps as he purposed to do. Because that's exactly what Jesus taught him. That anybody who is bringing forth the fruit of sin, let's say practicing it, if you want to use that word. Because somebody's sinning daily in thought, word, and deed, he's certainly practicing it, right? He's getting it right in his, in his mind. He's, practic- he's of the devil. He's not of God. He's not stepping in and out of the light, as, as uh, many of these pundits think. It's a simple truth, but yet it's obscured by all these fallacies about people that want to defend their sin. And that's all they do is search the scriptures to find defenses for sin. And then when they can't find any more, then they point the finger at us and say, you're preaching sinless perfection. No, we're not teaching sinless perfection. We're teaching that a person born of God truly went through repentance and filled with the Spirit is not committing sins unto death all day, every day, or messing up even twice a week or, or once a month. He's not doing that. That's not the walk in Christ. He said he may not be perfect in knowledge or free from ignorance, subject and prone to mistakes in judgment. But these aren't mistakes in judgment aren't falling into the bed of fornication or adultery. Mistakes in judgment are not going out and getting drunk with your friends. That's not mistakes. It's willful sin in a serious matter because you're insulting the spirit of grace. Look at the preposition again. I thought it would be interesting to bring this out again. The preposition in 1 John 1, 8 and verse 10 is the preposition used in the Greek. It's just uh, O-V, or, you know, again, I can't write ancient Greek, but it's something, something like that with a little squiggle line above it, a little jot or whatever they called it. That's the preposition, just like prepositions in our language, not, have not, cannot. It's the same preposition. If I say I have not sinned, I make him a liar and the truth is not in me. That's verse 10. Right? The same preposition used in verse 8. So we see that this can be this can be translated no, never, have not, or cannot in different places. Well, it can be used no, like it says no sin in 1 John 1 8. But it's misused in that verse. Here's where it's properly used. In 1 John, in 1 John uh, chapter 3, where he says, And you know that he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Same preposition. Properly used, no sin in him. Because there was no sin in Christ. He didn't become sin, didn't take our place, there was no transfers, none of that kind of stuff happened. That's properly used. But in 1 John 1, 8, they got the preposition turned around if I say I have no sin instead of I have never sinned. See, John was talking to the Gnostics here. The Gnostics at that time had claimed to have never sinned because there was the difference between the, the spirit and the flesh. The spirit was pure, the, fle- the flesh, everything material was sinful. So he's saying if you claim that you've never sinned, in your mortal body, well, then you're a liar and there's no truth in you. Sadly, the King James translators believe this myth of indwelling moral depravity and carefully selected this passage like they did others, like the Philippians passage where they said your vile body, where it just means your lowly body, translated everywhere else, but they say, no, your vile body. See, they believe that myth of inbred uh, moral depravity And you're going to have sin in you all the time. So they translated it carefully here that I have to admit that I have sin in me, dwelling in me, causing me to commit the act of sin all the time. And the blood's got me covered. If I just confess that fact of sin dwelling in me, I'll be perpetually cleansed under the blood, and that's the way I walk. But no, see, you're talking about walking, stepping in and out of darkness. Because he, he, says, he says before all this, if you read that entire context from verse 5, he's talking about, he says, there's no darkness in Christ. He says, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not know the truth. So there again, you're the liar. If you're stepping in darkness, like these guys thinking, well, because I have sin in me all the time, 